It's been the most important thing I've done in my life. It's been a privilege and an honor um, making important decisions about the well-being of six million very talented people. In the early hours of July the 1st, the last governor of Hong Kong left Britain's last significant colony for the last time. This is the story of the final years of British rule. A story of drama, crisis and conflict. A story told from the inside. A story so sensitive that it can only be told because Chris Patton is no longer the governor and no longer on what is now the sovereign soil of the People's Republic of China. Liberal Democrat, 25,000. The story begins five years ago. Christopher Francis Patton, conservative, 21,950. I felt bruised, sad. Not, I think, bereaved. I mean, I'd worked very hard in Bath. But you've got to be realistic about politics and indeed life. Um, uh, it ain't fair, necessarily. Patton was widely thought to be the most gifted politician in the Conservative Party, the architect of an unexpected Tory victory. It was sad that, um, you know, chairman of the party, and we won an election rather against the odds in a difficult recession. But I was the only cabinet minister careless enough to lose his seat. John Major offered his friend a place in the Lords and a senior role in the government, or the Prime Minister Governor of Hong Kong. Patton chose to give up the known for the unknown. Within weeks, he was en route for Hong Kong, well aware that he faced a monumental challenge. This is the last big job in our colonial history. I don't mean by, by starting like that. Um, to give the impression that um, what I want is a place in history. I think politicians who talk in that sense are pretty dangerous. With him, his wife Lavender, and two of their three children, Alice and Laura. It's not very long ago that the um, governor's wife used to curtsy to him. Um, I don't think I will get that uh, degree of, um, how can I put it, servile respect. Um, <laughs> you quite like it. <laughs> Just from time to time, say at Christmas. Patton was not only the last governor of Hong Kong, but the first to be a politician, not a diplomat. I'm sure that there will, from time to time, be people who say, it just shows what happens when you appoint a politician. A job like that, um, at the crossroads of Asia, you really need to have an old Asia hand stroking their nose. You needed a sinologist. Good lad, but didn't speak Mandarin. There'll be a bit of that. He was nervous. I have woken up once or twice early in the morning with that terrible feeling of falling. <laughs> it's, um, it's an adventure. Christopher Francis Patton. I, Christopher Francis Patton. We're like people swimming and drowning. And we would grasp at anything that's thrown our way. And now we are being thrown Patton. But what is he going to be able to do for us? We don't know. Swear that I will well and truly serve. I thought it was pretty good news for Hong Kong. 
because we've had too many of these diplomats from the Foreign Office who only believe in kowtowing to Beijing. Our sovereign lady, Queen Elizabeth II. I feel very, very depressed indeed. Not because I, I want British rule to continue, but because we're going to be returned to a communist regime. In the office of governor of Hong Kong. On the one hand, the community wants more democracy. On the other hand, they do not want to have a major row with China, nor do they want democracy, which is not capable of lasting beyond 1997. And I will do right to all manner of people. Now how he's going to live through the next four and a half years, how he's going to deliver whatever he promised, that's the key question. So help me God. Patton's new home in the center of Hong Kong was dwarfed by the skyscrapers which had sprouted up around this last imperial outpost, Government House. It was a colonial mansion, suitable for public entertaining on the grand scale. The Pattons had lived modestly in London. Now they had cooks and butlers, chauffeurs and bodyguards, and on Britain's behalf, they intended to make the most of it. I mean, one thing one has to do is something about the um, covers. There was to be some privacy. And this is up to our apartment where um, sleep, eat, work early in the morning. Day. Yeah. yeah, and the kids are up in the tower, which is above here, which is, uh, was put in by the Japanese when they were occupying Hong Kong in the war. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> I study. Five years, scribble, scribble, scribble. Patton's task was daunting. Hong Kong does not feature in very large letters. To negotiate the transfer of sovereignty over Hong Kong, geographically a pimple on the bottom of the People's Republic, to China. I think most Chinese, but certainly for that, um, for the immortals, for the um, Long March generation, um, pretty fatal, literally, once you start calling yourself an immortal. Uh, but for that generation, it's about the national humiliation of the Opium Wars, it's about reasserting Chinese sovereignty and in the process closing a page on what they regard as a humiliating episode in Chinese history. Once a barren island, Hong Kong was now a precious jewel in Britain's colonial crown. And there's going to be croquis there. Croquis on the lawn. I had, I've, I've discovered there is a croquis set and I had the lawn cut this morning. Are you going to try and learn to be slightly less competitive at it? It's a bit loose. <laughs> no, certainly not. I sat there last night looking at um, the buildings, the lights, you know, what, what is one of the greatest views in the world. Uh, astonishing uh, scenes. And I thought, you know, have we ever really understood um, what makes all this? Do those old men in Peking, do they actually understand what makes all this? Hong Kong was created by buccaneers, merchant venturers, and refugees. Uh, wait a minute, Angela, where am I staying in Singapore? Uh, Sheraton. Sheraton? The last time was Sheraton. Ghastly. Mm -hmm. But, no. I'll... It sounds very bad. I'll, I'll get out of there. Where are you staying? The Shangri-La? All right, I'll stay at the Shangri-La. I was turned on by this place. Um, I'm a sort of, um, I mean, I like selling things. I like rushing around. I like people. I like sort of... Um, uh, meeting people. I, I like the Chinese, the local people, genuinely. You know, people say they do and they don't really mean it. I really, I think they're fabulous. Um, and, um, yeah, I saw a chance to make some money. Right, I'm just going to see Andy Hunt. Simon Murray, the boss of a great corporation, what? was a big beast in a fiercely competitive jungle. It's lethal. It is absolutely as bloody as it, you could possibly imagine. Lots of grins and shaking hands and banquets. Under the, underneath that, lethal. Huge jealousies, very clannish. There's a sort of, um, there's almost an Italian streak in the, <coughs> in the Chinese. They, they really gang together and they have their hates and loves and um, um, very, very tough. One of the things that has made Hong Kong exceptional is as a place to make big dough is, is land, property. You've got six million people living on a piece of land half the size of Greater London. <clears throat> Insufficient land for the number of people who are here. And all the big players have really all made their money out of land. 
Um, I mean, I once bought a flat, and I put one and a half million dollars down on it. Two weeks later, an Amazon telephone said he wanted to buy my flat for $10 million. I thought it was a joke, hysterical. And, <clears throat> but it was for real, so it was gone. Now, that's a tiny deal in Hong Kong. Imagine the guys who were doing this on a scale of not a flat, but 10,000 flats. So these guys walking around here, they are billionaires by any standard in any, any currency. Peter Wu was one of Hong Kong's most powerful tycoons. Yeah. But the towers over there, the Gateway Tower, from there onwards, all the way across, the Ocean Terminal, this is the whole property, the core assets of the company. And uh, this is where cargo handling, there were go-downs, there were wharfs. I mean, in the old days, the, you'll see the piers coming out uh, with P&O ships here. A uh, long time ago, cargo ships here, and in the old days here, you have 3,000 coolies, or hard labor dock workers here. 3,000. Hong Kong's container port is the largest in Asia, and in 1992, it was growing faster than any other in the world. Hong Kong is the world's only merchant city. Hong Kong's a free port. It is a trade, and a creation of trade cargo you see here is in fact the essence of Hong Kong the creation of cargo the facilitation of cargo and the movement of cargo because cargo itself represents work and work represents employment when you see growth of cargo it means growth of employment to me it means prosperity and that is the essence of Hong Kong <coughs> There was a Hong Kong myth that with hard work and a bit of luck, any one of the colony's six million subjects might become a tycoon, might. As it was, jobs were plentiful, unemployment almost unknown. Ung Kun Leung was a refuse collector. His parents were refugees from China and he'd been born and raised as a colonial subject. He had no complaints. Mr. Ung's main concern was to get promotion, to become a foreman. He and his family live in a tower block, one of the scores of thousands of identikit apartments into which families like the Ung's are crowded. To provide for their two children, his wife supplemented their income by mending clothes and babysitting. Self-reliance was, in fact, the colony's watchword. At Government House, Patton installed his own team, led by his private secretary, Martin Dinham, and his political advisor, Edward Llewellyn. Okay, well, let me find the reference, then I'll ring you back, and then we can find out where we are on the permit for the dog. Okay, thanks a lot, then. Bye. Working closely with the Hong Kong Civil Service, these insiders were to help the governor devise a strategy to protect Hong Kong's freedom after the transfer of sovereignty to China. Are you eat the tables? Such a naughty dog yesterday. The most interesting editorial in the mainstream press is in the Economic Journal, which is quite a long editorial. Yeah. And the gist of that is quite positive. Mike Hansen, his press secretary. Yeah. How many people purchase Wen Wei Po? Do you know anybody who reads Wen Wei Po, Tom? <laughs> Wen Wei Po usually spoke for Beijing. Just <laughs> joking. <laughs> a very good cartoon. And you toast this morning. 
In a colony where the press was free and vociferous, the media was to play a crucial part in the governor's game plan. I like um, Fei Pang's theatre. It's extremely funny. All right. Jenny. Chat has lunch tomorrow. Would you like to go to that? I don't know if you've seen a list of, of, of members. They lunch at the Hong Kong Club every Thursday. If, if it's not a good day, we can... We can make it... There was to be an endless round of official duties. Yeah. Make it in December. Telegrams. I think we need. It was important to keep in touch with London. In the name of open government, Patton went on the offensive from the start. Hoping to secure their respect, if not their allegiance, he invited the media to Government House. Very pleased to have started work this morning uh, in earnest. I'll be spending as much time as I possibly can out of the office uh, visiting. Uh, uh, the citizens of Hong Kong uh, in their own homes and communities. The people of Hong Kong had no experience of political populism. The idea that their governor should come down amongst them was alien, but rather flattering, precisely as Patton had calculated. I don't have any of the traditional legitimacy of, of um, government. I'm uh, an appointed chief executive, and I've got to earn people's trust and understanding by trying to appeal directly to people. I'm not sure how popular it'll be with some of the um, Peking leading press, but I'm sure it's right. Through my presence on the streets or in people's communities to try to establish that I'm working in the interests of the six million people who live out there. The kissing baby touch was unknown in Hong Kong. Or a millionaire. Can you careful, careful, careful. Let, let the lady take it. Hi Andy. I just want to have two minutes. Look, I'm going to sing. People in Hong Kong are mesmerized by money, not so much because of greed. How much more we got to spend on that? 500 million? It's to get security. There's something out there behind them. And of course, today, Big China is getting nearer. And we've got to make some money, because with that money, we can buy our security. We can buy a ticket out of here. We can buy some property overseas. We'll be OK. Without money, you're dead. The big players in the colony, like the property developer Vincent Lowe, liked to think that Hong Kong would always prosper, so long as politics was not allowed to get in the way of money-making. This project was one of scores, instant apartments to meet the mass market for public housing. How long is it before that down there is the same height as the one we're in? Well, it's six days per floor. Six days for each floor only? For each floor. And so if you multiply by another 20 stories before we reach our hike here, it's uh, 120 days. And how many flats will that be at the end of it? Uh, for this whole site, it's uh, 4,400 units that we're building now. What's the contract worth? This is about $1.2 billion. We are obviously not idealistic people. Hong Kong is not an idealistic place. And to put it bluntly, we are very materialistic, very capitalistic. And that's how we survive. That's how we prosper. And we make no... Five years ago, that was the authentic voice of this schizophrenic community. Buccaneering, shameless, vibrant, and boastful. Yes, all of that. But there was also another Hong Kong. A Hong Kong that treasured political freedom and human rights, and that was hungry for more democracy. That Hong Kong was haunted haunted by a particular date, June the 4th, 1989, and a particular place, Tiananmen Square. Tiananmen Square shocked the world.
Here was a regime that could not tolerate dissent, that would deploy the People's Liberation Army to mow down unarmed demonstrators. If this was the present in China, what would be the future in Hong Kong? In horror, the people of Hong Kong took to the streets. They numbered a million. Among their leaders, a lawyer turned politician, Martin Lee. I never thought how much the Hong Kong people really believed in democracy until those many demonstrations, peaceful and so on, showing the whole world that the people of Hong Kong are certainly mature politically. And those marches were not just in support of democracy for Hong Kong, but it was also democracy in China. And you see immediately in the hearts of Hong Kong people the link between China and Hong Kong which was not there before, Tiananmen Square brought us together and brought the Hong Kong people together. And that is suddenly a Hong Kong spirit found, a Hong Kong identity found, which was very important. It had taken Hong Kong almost 150 years to assert that identity. ruled the waves. Hong Kong was an insignificant island in the Pearl River Delta, on the southern tip of China, 2,000 kilometers from Beijing. Canton, at the head of the delta, was a prosperous city where great trading nations... The foreigners were regarded as barbarians by the Chinese, but they were free to trade in all manner of goods, the most profitable of which was opium. Although opium had been banned by the emperor, the Chinese authorities connived with the British to turn a blind eye to what for both of them had become a very lucrative trade. Then the deal fell apart. What began as a diplomatic tiff became an all out row which soon led to the First Opium War, a naval skirmish in which the British easily triumphed. In January 1841, the Union Jack was hoisted on the island of Hong Kong, to the irritation of the Foreign Secretary, Lord Palmerston, who dismissed Britain's latest acquisition as a barren island. Hong Kong rapidly acquired the trappings of a permanent British outpost. Fifty years on, in 1898, the British acquired a 99-year lease on a neighboring slice of the Chinese mainland, which they called the New Territories. This lease would expire in 1997. China itself was crumbling, and early in this century, the empire finally collapsed. The result, a civil war between the nationalists, led by Chiang Kai-shek, and the communists, led by Mao Zedong. In 1937, their struggle was interrupted by the Japanese, who seized this moment to invade China. Four years later, they drove the British out of Hong Kong and stayed there until the Allied victory in 1945. With the end of the Second World War, China's civil war broke out again. In 1949, the victory of Mao Zedong's communists led scores of thousands of nationalists to flee across the border into Hong Kong. They settled in squatter camps on the hills around the city. In the face of this misery, the British had little choice but to resettle the refugees.
Among the new settlers, it was the merchants from Shanghai who were to re-emerge as tycoons in Hong Kong. By the time of Patton's arrival, they were mighty subjects, mightily anxious about the last governor. Chris Patton had his anxieties too, and not merely about new suits and new shirts. There was the first governor to decide against a plumed hat, a ceremonial uniform, and a knighthood. He still hoped to cut a dash. This would be too bright for your job, Tom. Boy! <laughs> These shirts. Yeah. God. Like Nicholas Fairbairn's trousers. Yeah, that's why I was thinking, to show you a little bit brighter look, how the people they were in the electrical oh, sometime. Oh, God. Couldn't get elected if you wore that. Uh, Lavender Patton hoped to learn Cantonese for her own sake and to demonstrate a family commitment to Hong Kong. That commitment was sincere, though the language was to prove elusive. Ah, yes, of course. Ma Wui. As his contribution to Hong Kong's economic boom, the governor was required to promote the colony's genius for trade. In this case, a new phone system. The new boy thought of a wheeze. He'd ring back to government house, if only he could remember the number. Can I speak to uh, Richard Paul? <laughs> 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 what am I? I'm the governor of Hong Kong. Hello? I don't think she believes me. Oh, well, what a breeze. She didn't believe That's you. The end, the, the end of Laurel and Hardy for today. The governor's overriding priority was focused on an old building huddled beneath the skyscrapers the Legislative Council. From outside, it looked genuine enough. Inside, it seemed much like any other debating chamber in a free society, but it wasn't. Of the 60 seats here when Patton arrived, only 18 were directly elected. The rest were either appointed by the governor or selected by the most powerful and prominent groups in the society. Patton wanted to change that, but his room for maneuver was limited. Under this, the Joint Declaration of 1984, Britain agreed to return Hong Kong to China. The treaty made no reference to democracy, although it was agreed that this LegCo would be constituted after 1997 by, and I quote, elections, though what form these elections might take was carefully left open. The other sacred text was China's basic law of 1990, a sort of mini constitution for Hong Kong in which Beijing undertook to extend democracy with the aim ultimately, and rather vaguely, of reaching one person, one vote. Ultimately. Within the terms of these two sacred texts, Patton had to devise a framework for the 1995 elections. In private, from the very beginning, he was absolutely clear about his intentions. What I propose doing is finding all those um, bits of elbow room that I think exist between the joint declaration and the basic law for bedding democracy down or extending it. There are a lot of ways, I think, in which we could broaden the democratic structure of the Legislative Council without, in the short term, taking the Chinese on on something which they regard as a fundamental issue. Patton knew that that would be easier said than done that to meet the growing demand for democracy in Hong Kong was bound to set the alarm bells ringing in Beijing, where the very idea of greater democracy reeked of British treachery and subversion. I mean, I think there are two um, uh, worries, two aspects of paranoia. One, um, that um, somehow we're trying to uh, rip them off, rip Hong Kong off, rip off um, China. Uh, when uh, the Royal Yacht came into Hong Kong a few years ago. Um, there was a rumor went round that it had come in to take the gold away. Uh, and that is still, uh, I think, uh, a suspicion that uh, some of our interlocutors 
there's a good non-piratical word for you, have. Um, secondly, I think some of them suspect that um, having come to democracy rather late in Hong Kong, a uh, democratic time bomb um, to blow their system to smithereens. Patton did not intend to detonate any such time bomb, but he already knew enough on his second day in office to suspect that the political reforms he had in mind would provoke a severe reaction in Beijing, and therefore that the so-called through train by which it was hoped that everyone elected to this council in 1995 would travel safely through 1997 and beyond, that that through train could easily be derailed. What you'll first of all see is um, denunciatory articles in their newspapers here. They will say is, um, uh, we've got to have, um, if you want a through train, it's got to be on tracks that we agree with. Um, I fear that they will want um, tracks that we would regard as totally unacceptable. But I think, um, I think that if I can keep the argument within the framework which I've described of the joint declaration on the one hand and the basic law on the other, I can probably get away with it. Two months after his arrival and six days before he was to make the most important speech of his political life, Patton paid a duty call on Beijing's diplomatic outpost in Hong Kong, the New China News Agency. He was there to celebrate China's National Day, in the full knowledge that his hosts suspected foul play, that he had broken their rules, that he was about to defy them by introducing a new structure for democratic development in Hong Kong without seeking their permission first, that in their terms, but on Hong Kong's behalf, he had refused to kowtow. Mr. Christopher Patton, Governor of Hong Kong, to come to the podium and propose a toast. Patton also defied the rules by refusing to deliver his speech to the Chinese in advance. He spoke off the cuff instead. Director, ladies and gentlemen, I want uh, to speak uh, this evening from the heart about the five years between now and 1997. Five years during which I hope we will be able to build an ever closer relationship between Hong Kong and China. There will be occasions, it has been known, when we may disagree about this or that. But I'm sure that we'll always be able to overcome those disagreements on the basis of mutual respect, mutual respect for each other's honor, and integrity and sincerity. Outside, there was a protest, an annual event. In Hong Kong, the rights to free assembly mirrored those in Britain, and demonstrations were frequent and noisy, but rarely violent. This was routine policing for Commander Dick Lee, but like many of his colleagues, he was worried about the future under Chinese sovereignty. We, we might be asked or might be ordered to perform duties that we do not want to perform. Say in a crowd control situation, what we are doing now is to maintain law and order. But perhaps after 1997, we'll be asked to uh, exercise force on the crowds. Uh, that is unnecessary. In other words, in simple terms, we, we are afraid that we'll be ordered to do things that we do not want to do. The fear of the police was that under Chinese sovereignty, they might be ordered to violate human rights. In 1992, Dick Lee knew where he stood. I, as a professional officer, has been trained in Hong Kong as a professional officer. I have to stand up and say no. You would refuse to obey orders? I would, if I'm asked to do things that, in my opinion, is immoral and incorrect. But I must say I'll stay until the very last minute, because this, this is my home. This is a place I was born, brought up, educated. I want to stay. I want to serve the people of Hong Kong. At Government House, behind the colonial calm of an endlessly titivated exterior, Patton and his team had reached the point of no return. 
while we are constrained in our ability to fight inflation, we are certainly not powerless. We shall be vigorous in our search for savings. They put the final touches to a speech in which Patton would reveal how he had found the elbow room between the joint declaration and the basic law to enhance democracy in Hong Kong without breaching Britain's agreements with China. Saying this, Hong Kong's position is strong, semicolon, but it is not impregnable. Stop. All right? I've got a dictionary of synonyms. This is the most valuable, I promise you, it's the most valuable, no, it's, it's better than the thesaurus, it's an American, it's mine. These are all my trade secrets which I'm letting you into. Which is better, embody, incarnate, personify, exemplify, express, identify, reify, include, comprise, embrace. 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 They're basically boring and they can be reprinted to our great credit politically. <laughs> in the Dai Gung Bao and other patriotic newspapers in Hong Kong. They show that you read assiduously the People's Daily. <laughs> and on the whole, this is a, this is a genuflection in the direction of those that you would otherwise kowtow. 111, 12, 13. I find this very convincing. <laughs> Just as well, isn't it? There's a real danger in the sort of position I'm in of turning up at the end of the day with a wonderfully sensible rational policy which nobody agrees with um, a sensible rational policy which the liberals martin lee and co, co don't agree with because it doesn't go far enough uh, and which the conservatives don't agree with because it goes too far and annoys china and i could easily fetch up with a wonderfully um well thought out policy um which only um chris Patton thought was um sensible The polls showed that most people in Hong Kong longed for greater democracy, an aspiration thwarted by a deadly alliance between the British Foreign Office, the Chinese government, and Hong Kong's most powerful tycoons. I don't think anybody in Hong Kong has anything against democracy, but it is so pragmatic here that people know that democracy has its own limitations. And the issue is not in terms of whether we have democracy or not. The issue is that how to maintain Hong Kong as a merchant city. I don't think we necessarily associate our freedom with democracy. Because for the very fact that we believe economic prosperity is our protector, is our guarantee for the future, is the assurance of individual rights. It's one o'clock, just hours before the governor's inaugural address to the legislature. By the day of his speech, word was out that Patton's proposals might be far more radical than the Democrats had dared to hope. Margaret Ung, a barrister, was widely regarded as Hong Kong's most acute political colonist. Skeptical by instinct, she was cautiously optimistic. The thing, the important thing about today's speech is that this is the first time we have any concrete basis on which to judge Chris Patton as a governor. He came, uh, there was a lot of publicity. Um, we read it as PR, uh, PR uh, work. I don't, I'm not against PR work, but I wouldn't like a governor to be all PR work. And this is the first time he, he tells us what he really thinks about Hong Kong and what he proposes to do. I expect Peking to be quite upset. Uh, not just because he is going to, there are all these rumors about broadening the basis of, of, uh, of election to functional constituency, the direct, direct election in district boards, all these things. I don't think so much for specific proposals as the fact that the governor is putting forward all these proposals without even making a pretense that he has talked to them first or consulted them first. I think this is the thing which would upset China most. Do you like the fact that he's doing it this way? Oh, absolutely. I think that is the only way to do it. We've been getting um, signals from Peking, uh, storm warnings rather than signals for um, the best part of a week. Um, it's, of course, the way Peking customarily does business. Um, so it's a bit difficult to know whether it's any different now from other times. It was different. 
Although Beijing had agreed in principle that Hong Kong should have a more democratic system for the upcoming 95 elections, the Chinese were furious that Britain had dared to refuse their demand for a secret veto over the governor's blueprint. Instead, the last moment. Um, then last Saturday, our ambassador was summoned and given a stern note from Mr. Liu Ping. At the same time, we had two calls along private channels um, saying how furious the Chinese were. And all the messages, both formal and informal, said that I should not make my proposals on 1995, that I should keep quiet about them until I discussed them with China. Um, but I expect Peking to be pretty savage and try to frighten the community here into um, turning their back on the proposals I've got for greater democratization, modest though they are. Um, that's the way things have played in the past, and I imagine that the rhetorical thunderbolts bolts will start raining down. Bye. Good luck. Do I see you when it's the press conference? The die was cast. The question, how would Hong Kong react? I owe it to the community to make my own position plain. I have spent my entire career engaged in a political system based on representative democracy. It would be surprising if that had not marked me. It has. My goal is simply this to safeguard Hong Kong's way of life. So the pace of democratization in Hong Kong is, we all know, necessarily constrained. But it is constrained, not stopped dead in its tracks. Standing still is not an available option. Hong Kong's way of life Patton's blueprint did not call for any more directly elected seats, but he did seek to increase the number of indirectly elected seats, and most dramatically, to give almost every working adult the right to vote in these so-called functional constituencies. What these arrangements should give us, therefore, is a through train of democracy running on the tracks laid down by the basic law. Hong Kong was astounded. The international media was bowled over, and the Democrats were delighted. I must say, after those five years of booth and governorship, they simply didn't trust the British at all. Uh, but yesterday, when they heard it, they were so shocked. It's really almost complete disbelief, because there were a number of very good ideas which we never thought of, like those nine constituency seats. Um, well, effectively, because it is so wide, uh, it's almost like democratic elections. The old public position is we need 30 directly elected uh, seats. The private position is we've got a lot more than we could have hoped for. Yes, I think last night, in fact, after a long session, some of my people actually went for drinks to celebrate. We never celebrated anything before. <laughs> How are you going to manage to celebrate in private and in public say, we've got to have more? That's not difficult. I mean, I just pull a long face in public. Patton now had to fight for his proposals against a media barrage from Beijing. The tycoons were quietly horrified. We know that China will be reacting very strongly because we've been dealing with them for years. Particularly our group, we've been dealing with them on the drafting of the basic law and what we had to go through at that time to try and get our points across to them. And we know that a head-on confrontation will not serve the purpose and we know exactly how China is going to react. Beijing's political friends were close to panic. 
I mean, when you say a British governor of Hong Kong is irresponsible, uh, that's strong language. You know, w with, with Chris Patton's experience, I think he knows what kind of language that the Chinese uses. It's a very serious matter. Don't forget, after 1997, the consequences will be lived by the Hong Kong people, not Chris Patton. He will be leaving Hong Kong. Right? How China is going to treat Hong Kong at that time, that's the important aspect that we have to face. Though Patton's critics had yet to go public, they now prepared for a war of attrition against the governor. I don't think it's proper at all, because we're looking at China, which is much more self-sufficient, self-confident, and self-reliant. And it's really a myth to think that they will not kill the goose that lays the golden egg. Today, I would say, we need China more so than they need us. Hong Kong will never be able to survive without China. And China can survive without Hong Kong. The simmering row between Britain and China was now a matter of very public debate among the six million people of Hong Kong. In their new territory's apartment, the reaction of the Ung family was not at all untypical. I'm sorry that uh, in a concentrated effort to engage the public directly. The governor invited anyone and everyone to a series of open meetings. Indeed, to be perfectly honest, don't speak Cantonese at all. Uh, but I very much hope Beijing's allies were well organized and well to the fore. Mr. Governor, I would like to ask you something on the 1995 direct election. Actually, all the arrangements have been clearly laid down in the basic law and in the joint declaration. Smooth transition in Hong Kong is what we want, and I think you should discuss more with China. Looking back into history, we can see that every time the British retreated from her colonies, there will be troubles. I live in Hong Kong, and I want to die in Hong Kong. I don't want to see that you made a mess of Hong Kong. Uh, the proposals that I made yesterday, proposals for discussion with China, were entirely consistent with the basic law and the joint declaration. They were consistent in every part. And frankly, it is for others, if they disagree with me, to point out where my proposals are inconsistent and to put forward their own proposals. Uh, your name is what? Or if you're called Chris, you can certainly have a question. <laughs> but we'll have, first of all, number six. First of all, number six, and then everybody in the audience called Chris. They were close to the microphones. I mean, I could tell when I then started watching them, watching who, who clapped, particularly the first chap. Um, I could see who they were. I didn't spot the one at the back. He was too far away. But it's a standard line. I mean, it's the line you get in um, polite conversation from Chinese negotiators, that we wrecked every country that we ever left, um, that we'll wreck Hong Kong. I mean, it's, it's standard Chinese Marxist kit. Crap, of course. <laughs> Whiskey. So his, his tongue's hanging out all the time. Patton was buoyed up by the reaction to his performance from London. I had a really nice um, letter from the Prime Minister. Um, Douglas said some very nice things about me at the party conference, and uh, the Prime Minister was saying some excessively flattering things in his speech, um, one of which, one of which will be misunderstood in um, here. He's going to say he looks forward to me returning to British politics in due course, which, in a way, um, I would have um, deleted from the speech um, if I'd had any choice in the matter, but I couldn't conceivably um, go back to him and say that because it's extremely uh, well meant and um, I wouldn't want to 
give the wrong signals, though I think the likelihood of my returning to British politics is remote. Chris, win for Hong Kong, just like you won for us. And when you've done so, come back and join us in government because you'll still be welcome and we'll still be here. The following weekend, the governor retreated to his country house at Fan Ling. There, in relative peace, he prepared for his first face-to-face -face meeting with the Chinese in Beijing. Although they were angry, they were still clearly willing to discuss his proposals, however unpalatable that process might be. The governor was optimistic, despite the predicted thunderbolts that now reigned about him. What they've done is to go into um, a tactic which they understand, which is to orchestrate the pro-peaking press in Hong Kong, denounce me. There were, I think, up to Saturday morning, there'd been 40 commentaries or editorials um, calling me a running dog um, over the previous week. I think there were another 20 over the weekend. Um, it's been much more personalized than attacks ever have been before, and I think pretty vitriolic. But um, as I said this morning, um, if they think this is bad, they should read the British press. <laughs> In an atmosphere of heightened uncertainty, Patton set off for what he thought would be the first of many visits to the Chinese capital. In private, his advisers were hopeful, but cautious about his prospects. Among them, the most senior politician in Hong Kong, Baroness Lydia Dunn. I think the only scenario under which it would be difficult to press ahead is if China says categorically and publicly that if you do this, we will dismantle whatever you've put in place in 1997. Now, that would be a very st serious statement, and that would worry Hong Kong people, and that would then it would present us with a ma major dilemma. It would derail the program. It would derail the program. It would mean it would, in fact, destroy everything we're trying to achieve, which is a smooth transfer and everything post-97. He is in for a tough time. People's Republic was a communist paradox. The economics of freedom, the politics of repression. Patton's visit had to await the end of the 14th Party Congress. China's paramount leader, Deng Xiaoping, was ailing, and the autocrats around him were circling his political corpse. It was not a time for compromise, least of all with an upstart governor daring to tell them what was best for Hong Kong. I thought you were all in Hong Kong. <laughs> first of all, I'm extremely pleased to be in uh, Peking for the first time as governor. Um, I very much uh, recognize that we will have a number of uh, tough and difficult problems to cope with in the next few years. I'm sure that we'll be able to manage that um, in a calm and sensible and serious and understanding and dignified way. The old emperors, if they had a provincial governor who hadn't entirely behaved, used to send a simple and peremptory command, tremble and obey. And they will want to try to get me to tremble. Patton's first meeting was with the director of the Hong Kong and Macau Affairs Office, Lu Ping. I'm very concerned 
to try to establish a personal relationship with Liu Ping, who's my opposite number. I mean, I've got to have one or two people there who at least start to listen to what I say and take me seriously. Patton's style of diplomacy was very different from his predecessors. I think there was a certain sort of awe about dealing with China, which, um, which surprises me. Now, first of all, I would like to express my welcome to Mr. Patton on his first visit to Beijing in his capacity as the governor of Hong Kong. Director, we will inevitably in the next five years have many difficult challenges and difficult problems to overcome together. I'm sure we'll be able to overcome those in the interests of Hong Kong, uh, respecting one another's integrity and respecting one another's purpose. I think that they're bullies and they've got used over the years to um, other countries um, applying different criteria in their relations with China than they use in their relations with others. I mean, why should one play the game entirely by their rules? I have no doubt at all that I'll be judged above all when I fly out from Hong Kong in 1997, from whatever airport, uh, above all on how successfully uh, I have uh, helped to implement the joint declaration to ensure the stability, the prosperity and the way of life of Hong Kong. The talks were to last for six hours. Patton got nowhere in the face of Liu Ping's insistence that his blueprint for democracy was unacceptable. That evening, Patton returned to the British Embassy accused by China of violating understandings between London and Beijing, which had been made before his appointment as governor. It had been an exhausting encounter. I think not. Closeted with his advisers, he tried to assess the meaning of the rebuff, the scale of the damage. Then it was time to meet the press. My <laughs> sir, would it be in order for the governor of Hong Kong to have a gin and tonic? Would, would, before you go out or when you come back? When I come back. <laughs> I would get it like that. In the short term, what I don't know, is whether they will want to have a breakdown in Peking and say, that's it. No point in talking about this anymore. Um, good afternoon. We're all set up and ready to do satellite time, particularly all you. It had been a bad day, but Patton was not going to admit that in public nor was he about to surrender. What is the sense in me making accommodations, dishonorable accommodations, now on the assumption that the establishment in Peking was going to remain exactly the same until 1997? What would I look like then? How would I, I'd be an ornament, um, not a very attractive ornament for most of my time here. And it would all look like a very dishonorable way for Britain to end an important story.